Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Can My Child Play Conversations. Uh, I am the founder, the co-founder, and the uh, uh, host of Can My Child Play. My co-host this evening, as always, is Tanya Wilson. Uh, we are Jordan McNair's parents. And we started Can My Child Play Conversations based off of uh, a book that we wrote um, since our son Jordan passed from an exertional heat stroke in 2018. And basically the book is called Can My Child Play? The Questions That We Should Have Asked. So what we did was we took our form from the book to uh, just some candid conversations with people, real life people whose um, uh, children may have suffered an exertional heat stroke, survivors and non-survivors, and uh, just how we can prevent this from happening and how we can keep all of our young student athletes safe at all levels of competition from AAU all the way up to the collegiate level. So we try to bring people, like I said, that, you know, maybe some uh, heat stroke survivors, preferably, and uh, also a lot of uh, heat stroke fatalities we may have had their families on. So my guests this evening are Julia Taylor and Asa Taylor and their <laughs> good friend, Deb Carmichael. How you guys doing this evening? Good, how are you? Good, 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 good. So you guys have a realistic um, interest to be in Kim My Child Play Conversations. Uh, Asa, you had a heat stroke, was it in 2019? Yes, sir. In 2019. Um, and um, obviously, mom, you know, we know that can be an extremely challenging thing. I know the first time, the first question I asked Julia when she called and we spoke is, is Asa still, did he make it? Because a lot of times, you know, one of the main things is uh, heat strokes aren't bad. However, if they're mismanaged, they're bad. And what I mean by that, for those who don't know, and I, I just treat everybody as a, an, an initial listener and an, an initial listener to Can My Child Play Conversations as uh, somebody who doesn't know what a heat stroke is, basically like we didn't know. Basically that means that your body temperature, your core temperature goes above 104 degrees. And that's the equivalent in layman's terms of your body, your organs being in a microwave oven. And you have a 20 to 30 minute window to get that core temperature cooled down under 104 degrees. So therefore, the longer that a person's in that microwave oven, obviously the more damage is done. So again, keep in mind, a lot of times they aren't bad. However, when they're mismanaged, that's when they become problematic and even fatal. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the show again. So Asa, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, some things that you know, you're know you into and, and just share a little bit about because I, I'm confident that you'll be an ambassador for the Jordan McNair Foundation somewhere along the way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, uh, well, before, uh, I love basketball. I love football. But uh, baseball, sport. I love sport. Yes. Uh, anything with a ball in it, I could, I could play. But uh, since my... Uh, since since my heat stroke, um, I started getting into other things I really like, like music, recording music, producing music, uh, creating uh, clothing, drawing on shoes, customizing shoes, um, cooking. I like to cook. Yeah. Um, East egg and steak, <laughs> all that. But um, yeah, other than I like I'm working under a contractor, learning uh, learning some good things, but uh, right now I'm just focusing on making music and making clothes. Sure. And that's really sure. what I like to do. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, Asa, when I read your story when your mom called, and I'm saying, wow, he's 6'5", 300 pounds. Uh, what size shoe you wear? I wear 14. Okay, cool. Jordan wore 16, right. He was about <laughs> the same, same height, and uh, we had no problems getting shoes along the way. Never, ever had a problem getting sneakers. Yeah. Those, I mean, we were, just, we were just blessed beyond blessed. And, you know, funny story one time, Tanya and Jordan were in uh, Starbucks. And uh, people would always comment on Jordan's size, Julia, which I'm sure you can relate to. Because yeah. uh, he got big quick. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lady, you know, overheard Tanya talking. And Tanya was saying something about his feet. And she was saying, the lady overheard uh, Tanya speaking. And she said, Miss, excuse me, you know, I overheard your conversation. Um, my son plays in the NBA and I have nobody to give all these sneakers to. And the sneakers, 
she would just call us and say, hey, I'm sending a box. And it might be 30, 40 pairs of sneakers in there. You know, hey, look, Asa, she was sending donks and everything back then. And Jordan was in private in, in eighth grade. And the only thing, you know, like you kids do, he would only pull his 50 pairs of sneakers in there. He only won't pull out the Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would only pull out the Jordans with the donks and all that. Who knew the sneaker business would have evolved into what it's evolved into for sure. So Asa, you're out of school. And uh, uh, so real quick, why, so why basketball over being a lineman? Uh, I, I actually I played receiver. I played receiver. Oh, wow, <laughs> I a, really? Okay. Yeah, I, I can catch the ball. I can catch okay, the ball. So I can run with it. Do you like to get hit or what? No, I, I, I played receiver and defensive end. Right. I love, okay. I love, yeah, I, love, I love scoring touchdowns. Okay, cool, <laughs> uh, cool, cool. Yeah, hey, uh, I understand. I understand for yeah. sure. I understand. Uh, yeah, I really loved football. I loved football way more than basketball growing up. Okay. Um, everything I did with football when I was born, like the day or two yes. after, two days after I was born, I was at my brother's football game, and <laughs> you know, I'd run on the field. And, but um, over time, I just because I was always naturally good at basketball. I mean, at football, but um, at basketball, I really had to work at it to right. get good. So uh, I kind of just fell in love with being in the gym, getting up shots. I fell in love with it because I had to make myself good. Got it. Got and you know it's interesting because Jordan was kind of like that where he played flag. Uh, he just got big really quick before he went in the pads, and um, we played basketball. We played a little bit of everything, and then he found his his true calling in basketball. So we thought, and uh, one coach just kept saying, you know, he's a lineman, and I'm like, no, he's a basketball player. And Julia, let me tell you, he literally, you know, this coach was he was a big guy. And like he would kind of follow us around at basketball games. And we said, you know what, we'll give it a shot. And I'm glad that we did because one thing when Jordan came on the football field, not knowing a lick of really about football, he had quick feet. Mm -hmm. So we had basketball feet on him. So he could punch, move a lot quicker than a lot of his, his counterparts at that time. And uh, the timing just was right at the right time. So uh, yeah, I see you all have you have a lot in common, even down to the shoe size. You know, right. and that's and what you about a three, four X. Uh, two. Oh, okay, two. cool, 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 cool. Because everybody, you guys wear everything tight nowadays. So I yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I'm going, if I'm going baggy, I'll go with the, I'll go with the three X sometimes, but mainly two. Some some extra large. When I got out of the hospital, I was wearing a large. <laughs> yeah, I, <can't> <laughs> I was wearing a medium. Yeah, this is, this is different. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So you wound up going to a school in Colorado, correct? All right. So when this happened, were you a freshman? Were you a sophomore? Or what? Uh, yeah, I, I was a freshman. I'd only okay. been there. Uh, it actually happened a month from the day I got there. Okay. Cool. 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 So you guys were, um, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we we just stick to stories. We we don't deal with facts of the case. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, unfortunately, no parent wants to send their child away for them not to return. And unfortunately, you know, that that does happen. I mean, we, we lost one more young man in 2018, uh, Brayden Bradford. Uh, he died in, in, was it August 24th of 2000? That was your birthday, Tanya, I believe. Yeah. Um, and literally, you know, mom sent them to school. And I think the next day she got a call. Um, and, and no, no parent sends their child away for that. Uh, but you know, things, I, and, and I can't even give rhyme nor reason why these type of things happen, but I do know, however, prevention, education and awareness and prevention is really the key. And like I said earlier, you know, a heat stroke isn't a bad thing, but a mismanaged one, a mismanaged one always is, or a mismanaged anything, a mismanaged cardiac arrest where there's no preventive equipment or any type of concussions where there's no preventive equipment or somebody's not paying attention can always turn out really, really bad. So Asa, you, you, you go down and Julia, I know, you know, one of the biggest fears of a parent is to be so far away from your child. Luckily, Jordan decided to stay at home at Maryland. So when we got the call, Literally, like we we may have been down there, like and and it seems like we were there in fifteen minutes, but it could have been maybe a forty a 30, 40 minute ride. 
But I know we've talked to several parents that may have been in other states and they couldn't get there until, you know, one, one, um, Ryan Swoboda's dad, you know, mom, Sophia, she was in another state. Dad was in another state. Dad drove through the night to get the ride. Mom had to fly in the next day as soon as she could get a flight. So I know that was extremely challenging um, when you got the call saying that. Uh, saying Mark, that can I know, jump in here just for a second? Hey, One, Deb, tell us who you are, Deb. <laughs> I, I'm just a, a good friend of the family and have watched what Julie and Ace have gone through with all this and everything leading up to it. But one of the big pieces about uh, Asa going off to Colorado for school is where he came from. And that's, we're out here in Seattle. We're down at the ocean level. Mm. He went up to Colorado, the elevation change and all of that with one month of getting ready and the coaches seeing the kids come in from all over. Um, but especially someone coming down from sea level up to the elevation up in Colorado. That was a huge piece that I really think was missed. Yeah. And uh, again, something that as a parent or a friend or a coach, it wouldn't occur to you to ask about. Well, I think that, and, and, that, and, and again, Deb, thank you for bringing that up because I grew up in Denver. So I know exactly, mm -hmm. you know, I know exactly what it looks like there. And I remember as a, as a, as a, as a young man, a young child, you know, I would get really bad nosebleeds every time because the altitude was so high. And why a lot of East Coast football teams always had challenges when they played Den the Broncos at home because of that high altitude in a sense. But you would think that, you would think that coaches would know that. And the exactly. interesting thing is, you know, and we, the interesting thing is the average acclimatization period for any student athlete returning to play is at least seven to 14 days. 10 to 14 yep. days. There's a video on our website that shows uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Stephen Horwitz, um, basically we, as a video what I show everywhere that talks about that from A to Z, what it takes to from hydration to the acclimatization period and everything. And a lot of times, just my personal opinion, you know, we can't force a one size fit all workout on every kid. Yes. You can't do it. The last time I just told somebody this today, the last time I've ever seen a lineman run any longer than 15 or 20 yards is when the Ravens win the Super Bowl. <laughs> Kelly Gregg was a lineman. He literally picked up a fumble or something like that. And Ray Lewis literally pushed him into the end zone. And that was in 2000. <laughs> and Kelly Gregg may have been 5'11", 5'11", 300 plus pounds. And he literally pushed him into the end zone. So I just think that my personal opinion is that, you know, we put a lot of coaches want to do too much too quick. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, you know, we looked at all these things and, and we have a, a uh, program called Kobe, K-O-B-E. It's called keep on believing in K-O-B-Y. I'm sorry. Keep on, keep on believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we had to realize was every time that, uh, I looked at when we got Jordan prepared, I thought I taught Jordan everything that a father could possibly teach him. However, I didn't teach him to speak up when he felt uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's the main thing as parents that we have to do, because one of the main things I emphasize all the time is guess what? If it don't work out wherever you go, you're not going to live with the coach. You're coming back home to us. Yes. <laughs> We're going to support you if you stood up for what you believed in. Yes. We don't have, you're not going to live with somebody. You're not living with the coach with the school. You're coming back home to us. So Julia, you get this call. Tell me what went through your mind when you got the call. Is, let me ask you this. Is AC your only son or do you have no, other children? No, he's got a big brother who also oh, okay, played great. football too. Played okay. at the, got a scholarship to the University of Washington to play. He's a receiver. Okay. And, um, so I think we were blessed because the weekend before Asa's, um, heat stroke he had come home and so we asa told us that you know the coach is a bit extreme mom and he said the coach is mad because two guys on the team got into a fight and he's going to punish us when we get home i mean when we get back and so he was a little nervous so i gave him an, an, an out i was like asa gets too tough um Remind him that you had that that a car that he was riding in had gotten hit. So, you know, maybe you can use that as an out. You know, just thinking, but 
fortunately, I knew oh, we froze. that punishment coming, but I never thought it would be something that would almost kill my son. Um, uh oh, we've tickets. So, um, so I get the phone call from the coach, and I thought he was calling to check and see if Asa had really been in a car accident, if the car had actually hit his Uber. And he asked me if Asa had uh, seizures. And I was like, uh, no, he doesn't have seizures. What happened to my kid? And the way he explained it, Asa had a seizure, but he's fine. And that things were going to be okay. And But he told him he should drink water. And he told him he didn't need to finish this these sets of lines. I was like, sir, I know you were punishing these kids. But what happened to my son? And I never really got the, the truth, but I was like, when he, when he finally told me that my son was going to be airlifted to a hospital in Utah, I was just flabbergasted. My brother was with me. I think I lost it. Um, and so I just, for, I had come home, I had not come home, but we had gone to get a drink from Starbucks. And my brother's like, I'm taking to the, to the airport. A friend of ours had gotten a plane ticket for us. And I was on the plane with just my purse. And, but then still thinking, because the way the coach ended the conversation, I figured I'd walk in and tell Ace, you know, what are you doing? What did you do? And he'd tell me what happened and we'd laugh about it. And then I'd drive him back to school when he was feeling better. And um, so I, I had that kind of belief so much that when I went, because you, the, the airplane didn't drop us off at the hospital. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> so I had to get a rental car and I got, a, a, because we had just driven him out to the school the month before. So I knew what the terrain was like and it was scary. So I got a car that was big enough and had four wheel drive so I could drive him back to school. So I walk in to that hospital And it's nothing like I had expected. Um, my kid had a machine to breathe for him and he had tubes coming in and out everywhere. And uh, the doctor came in and let me know that this was not just a seizure. That my, my son was fighting for his life. So, um, it was at that point that, because I'd already called everybody and let them know he had been airlifted. But then I understood that he was in, he was in danger. And um, so we called everybody to pray, just everybody. And we're just begging God to, you know, I, I've done nothing to deserve your grace and your mercy. <laughs> but please, um, let me keep my boy. We had just left, lost my mom not even a year ago. And Asa was right there with me throughout the whole thing. She, she passed here at the house and he was just such a champion through that whole thing. And now here he is. I was like, God, you got my mom. Can you please let me? You know, but we as parents, we have to recognize that, you know, not my will, but God, your will be done. That's the hardest thing to say. How do you say that? You know, it's possibly I won't see him open his eyes again. And, um, but that's where our faith comes from because, you know, I had to have faith that God knew what was best. And then, of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I was kind of upset with him when I dropped him off at the airport because he had come home to visit. I'm thinking, oh, God. nothing is that important but you don't recognize that until you almost have nothing right but oh the day this guy opened his eyes <laughs> oh, Jesus. you know again it was nothing I did that I deserved it's just I, I had some grace and some mercy there and um the first thing this kid did when he opened his eyes was ask to let to call the coach, let the coach know he's going to be back tonight. Yep. 
Yep. You know, don't worry, crazy. coach. I'm going to be back tonight. Because yeah. he didn't know his coach had almost killed him. Or he didn't even know he had been he had been gone for two weeks. No, he he thought we were all at the um what was it? Because yeah. yeah, so they had been punished because two kids on the team gotten in trouble. So when he woke him and the coach said they had to um have study hall together as a team in a in a private room. So he thought we had all come to study hall and he was waking up and he had no clue that he couldn't even walk, you know. <laughs> I was like, wow, this, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. my kid's heart is. Won't he do it? Let me tell you. I oh, think gosh. That, uh, Julia, those two weeks that Jordan was in the hospital, you know, oh. you, I literally, you know, I, oh. I, I offered myself yes. every day. And, 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 and that's just, you know, as a parent, that's just what we do. Like, you know, hey, you know what? If, if it's between him and I, take oh. me. Just take know, me. Yes. Take me. And, and that's just a parent's a parent's um, love, you know, for their child. And that's just, you know, you, you can't, that's indescribable. And, and, and our actions only show that, that, you know, we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for that. But Julia, let me ask you this. So um, um, in regards to standing and consistent with the story, what was one of the first questions you asked when you got to the ER? What's wrong, what, what happened? What, Right, exactly. Okay. Now, yeah. did you direct that question to anybody in sp specifically, or was everybody it everybody came in? But then the the doctors, the nurses, everyone would come in, and every time they talked to me, they would tell me something worse. You know, oh, they said that they tried to get fluid from his spinal tap, and normally you can get like twenty cc's. They could only get two from him. It said as soon as he was, they were trying to take blood samples and it would clot as soon as it would get out. I'm like, why does it, why would this happen? Yeah. And, you know, that he was having swelling on the brain, mm. that he, uh, then there was just tubes just everywhere. And, and then when, the next day they tell me they got to move him to a different hospital because their hospital doesn't do transplants. Like who needs a transplant? And I, I just saw him this weekend and he didn't need a transplant, but there was no, it's, it was as if they're trying to figure all this out at the same time I am. And so they said their hospital wasn't, it wasn't high enough trauma for them to be able to rescue him. And so they got him ready. And, you know, what was beautiful is that all the nurses came along and hugged us and cried with us because it felt like, you know, this is my 18 year old son and we're going to get transplants, not just one. And, you know, just to know that they cared as much as we did about him. Um, but it, it, it felt like a chapter that was closing there. And I was praying that it wasn't the, the chapter that you can't open back up. So, um, they, so they had him move to U University of Utah Hospital. To the shock trauma? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, boy, things turned around there. You know, but we, we thought we were out of the woods because again, nobody really, nobody really knows what to expect in an exertional heat stroke. The doctor, everyone was, was trying to figure out, oh, why is he having a, a seizure? Well, instead of figure, trying to figure out why is he having a seizure on the basketball court, they should have been decreasing his temperature, right? Oh no, there was no, there was no, none of that until he got to the hospital. He'd been there and hot long enough to have killed. And someone just happened to take his temperature. How do you just happen to take someone's temperature and find out that they're too hot? And then he still wasn't emerged in a, a tub. It was, let's pack him with ice. And to this day, some of the doctors who were, who were helping us don't understand 
what exertional heat stroke can do to the, the organs. And so they're all surprised. Everything is a surprise. But like, I can't have any more surprises. <laughs> we can't do that. This is you guys' job. Uh, let me tell you, I think that uh, when I, um, uh, when we wrote the book, you know, my mom, she said, when she, my mom read the book, she said, wow, I didn't, when did you go to medical school? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, uh, I, I had a crash course, ma. I mean, I, I, those two weeks, but those first three or four days from Tuesday to Friday, literally, you know, I had to find out what was going on with Jordan. And, and it was a lot of sleepless nights because I didn't, I didn't have a clue. The question is, you know, we start asking questions as soon as we walked in the hospital. And I, first thing I asked was, you know, as any parent would ask, like, you know, what happened? My second question was to the athletic trainers. And I asked, it was two of them, um, had either, has, has this ever happened on either one of your shifts before? And they told me no. So we still didn't know what happened yet. But again, like you just said, we went from one hospital airlifted to a, to a shock trauma unit in Baltimore City. Um, and then we also went from um, a healthy kid Tuesday morning. The last time I talked to Jordan was Monday, May 28th. And Tanya, Tanya was taking him back to school. And something, she sent me a picture because he had, you know, that hairstyle, the cruddy hairstyle like Asa has. And his hair was cut short. Somebody, his barber had messed his hair up and he had to go to his other little butt friend that was a barber. And, you know, it was the typical, you know, father-dad conversation like, hey, I know practice starts tomorrow. You know, make sure, you know, call me later in the week. Because, you know, when they get at, at, to the college level, they only call you when they need something more. They only, you know, it's, look, I'll call you Monday. As long as you get to me by the end of the week, you know, we're fine. I, I, I'm all right with that. So we went literally from a healthy kid Tuesday morning to an emergency liver transplant Friday morning. And even, you know, as the days went on, it got very, very serious. And yeah. still as a parent, you're optimistic the whole way. I was, I'm telling you, and I were optimistic that Jordan was going to pull through maybe up until a day and a half before he passed. Uh -huh. But we were optimistic the whole time. And it was another family of a young man, uh, the class family, Gavin Class had had a heat stroke. Uh, I mean, literally, like, they came down to the hospital and, you know, really, he was a guy that was, you know, healthy and strong. He had a liver transplant. He had hundreds of surgeries. He battled cancer, but he still made it through. So this was like a shot of hope for us. And it was mm -hmm. like, wow, Gavin made it through. Jordan can make it through. The only thing was there was a cold water tub on the field the day that Gavin went down. And they put Gavin in the tub, but they pulled him out too quick. So still, so when they pulled him out the tub too quick, his body temperature rose back up above 106 degrees. Oh and um, basically, you know, he was, he, they basically said he was as close to dead as being dead could be. So luckily he survived. But I think that just gave us a real, real shot of hope and optimism that Jordan would pull through. And, um, and again, you know, that whole, you're in prayer circles and you asking for support and asking for prayer from everybody. And it was hundreds and hundreds of people at the hospital every single day in support of, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of the damage had already been done prior to getting there, you know, and that scenario that I gave with that analogy that I gave of your body man in a microwave oven, when it goes above 104 degrees, you know, it only takes a couple minutes to heat a pot roast up. So you can imagine what it's doing to, you know, um, a, a human organ. And and even in regards to the seizure part of it, that's usually how, that's when it gets really bad when the person starts seizing. So these are, you know, these are things, of, and I'm just glad that, you know, Asa made it through. Um, and, and again, you know, prayer works. And, and even when you, one of the hardest things to do is, Give it to God. That's the hard. It's, it sounds easy, but that's one of the most challenging things in the world to do. That is one of the most things to do. Um, so I know that. Uh, uh, so you guys got back from two weeks. So Asa, how was the bounce back or the recovery process for you? Uh, it was not good. Not good. Okay. Cool. I uh, for a good month and a half at least after. Every meal I ate, I threw up. Uh, everything you ate, you threw up, you said? Everything I ate, I threw up. Okay. Even before, like, 
my day would probably be wake up in the morning, throw up, eat food, throw up, go do something, throw up. Like, I had to bring a bucket with me everywhere I went. <laughs> yeah, remember the bucket? <laughs> I, still have, I still have the bucket. Gross, gross yellow bucket. I had to bring it with me everywhere I went because I just, I just kept throwing up. Um, I think part, like, uh, I was mad at my mom because uh, she wouldn't let me do anything. I was, uh, I was trying to go see my old friends, my old coaches and stuff that were, you know, like, they're like there for me when I was in the hospital, trying to go see them, trying to go to my old high school they were playing at that time. My mom wouldn't let me leave the house. Uh, she just wanted me, she wanted me home. And it was, it, it was frustrating because I felt like, like, you know, like, I can't, I can't do anything. And it felt like in that month and a half, it felt like it was going to be like that forever. And um, it just felt like I was never going to like just be able to just call and do something again. It felt like I would never be able to uh, play basketball again, do anything I really loved. Because like, yeah, I got the uh, final tap in the hospital. That hurt for for months after pain in my back and I still get I still get that pain um but uh it was really hard and physically but then mentally just like not really understanding not understanding what happened not understanding why my, why my coaches stopped texting me on my uh like just why every why like why it all happened because you know nobody yeah but why every like I felt like I was like kind of alone because like I didn't know anybody who else had gone through what I'd gone through. I didn't know anybody I could really talk to. I didn't trust anything. I didn't trust anybody because when I was in college, I had a really good um, I had a really good relationship with coaches. Not a really good, but I had a good I had a really good relationship with one of them. With who Asia? How did he? Uh, I said I had a I had a I had a really good relationship with her, and um, he, uh, he like we talk about you know let's play video games after practice this this and that. And he actually stayed on campus with us, and then as soon as I'm in the hospital, I don't hear from him again. And I'm just like yo, what like what's going on? Like, I don't what just happened. One minute I'm running I'm running sprints. Seven minutes left. I'm like, oh, come on. Next, I wake up. I think one of the one of the main things that causes us confusion is that no one from the school ever came and visited. Him. Um, even though we had people from Seattle fly, and he was in the hospital out there long enough for someone to at least, you know, fake it a little bit, but to not only not show up, but not call anymore. And well, it's like, even if you are afraid that someone's going to say it's your fault, you still treat my son like he's my son. You know, like you would want your child to be treated if they're struggling to even take a, a, a step, you know, and to see him getting, he had to get shots in his stomach three times a day, painful. Um, you know, just seeing him try to figure out how to move his body again, how to walk, how to get in and out of bed and, you know, all this stuff he's going through because he did what a coach said for him to do. And and, 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 you know, thank God for Miss Deb who made us feel like we were important, like his life mattered um, and, you know, showed us how she felt about Asa and, you know, causing Asa to be able to smile and, and, and know that his life matters to someone, you know, you, you expect it to matter to your mom. Uh, you know, <laughs> then here comes Miss Deb, and she becomes mom number two. <laughs> but but the big piece there is 
Asa, you came home and you've always been the sunshine in all of our lives. And there's so many people around here in Seattle that you were that person to, but the ones that were your age group, they were your age group, which means they're all off at college and you came home. So there are kids, sorry, young men all over the world, all over the country who care and we're, we're funneling their care through me or through Coach Rome or Coach Kelly or Coach Ice and through to you. But that, I may not be your mom, but I'm still an old part. So I know that, that Julia may say I was there and brought some sunshine, but it, it hurt so much to see how much you were missing your peers because they're off figuring out their first year of college. And uh, I, I, you, you shouldered through that so incredibly. And I know that I got to see the sunshine and your mom got to see the frustration. Yeah, a little bit of rain. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the rain, but uh, your, your heart uh, is still shining through so much. Yes. And Asa, let me, let, me, let me tell you this. You know, one of the main things, um, or well, several, several things, you know, I think that as young people, when I look at Jordan's teammates and, and those that, um, uh, and I'm thinking about you as well, just from what you just said, you know, one of the main things that, unfortunately, some of us, some of you all young, some of you young people can see the world isn't a nice place. And it's not, and a lot of people in it aren't, you know, um, they aren't who they say they are, for lack of a better term. And especially in college football and sports and things, I'm sorry, especially in, in collegiate sports, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have a lot of coaches, you know, we were just talking about this yesterday, you know, you go through the recruit, the recruiting process and, you know, coaches, you know, they're going to call you every day and, you know, they come to visit and they, you know, doing all these things. And then when you get to the school, you know, of choice or whatever, they act like they don't even know you at that point, because you may have been a star in high school. And then when you get to, you know, whatever school or, or, or a, a high level of uh, education you may get or a high level educational institution you may get to, now you are starting all over again. So you may be at the bottom of the totem pole, you know, and guess what? Everybody on the team can play. So you may be four star, but over here, you may come back to be starting out as one star again, you know, those stars, they, they follow you, but at the end of the day, you still got to prove yourself or, you know, kind of create your way when you get to that collegiate level. And I think a lot of times what happened with, with um, or in our situation, Jordan's teammates saw the real, the world really wasn't a, a great place. And, and it kind of, Julia, makes us think because at least you asked the questions and at least Asa told you like, ah, mm -hmm. the coach is a little, you know, he's a little extra where, mm -hmm. You know, with us, you know, they get to that age group where Jordan was a very kind of quiet guy. He was kind of stoic and, you know, he was very, very thoughtful and, you know, he was very methodical. So we never even thought to ask, hey, is everything OK? Mm -hmm. And probably he would have probably said, hey, it's, it's OK anyway. You know, we unless and, and I think that that's one of the things that I encourage with parents as well when, you know, we, we do trainings and things like that, ask if you ask a one a, a one question answer or one word question, guess what? You're going to get a one word answer. Yes. How was school today? It was good. You know, mm -hmm. like okay, how was school? It was okay. You know, how are things working out? Oh, I'm good. You know, and that's just young people in general. So I applaud the fact that you know you had that open line of communication uh, with mm -hmm. Asa for him to even tell you that. Guess what, coach? You know, he's a little extra here. You know, and and mm -hmm. when we talk to a lot of parents once, you know, our whole story kind of blew up and, you know, really we saw like what was really going on with the coaching staff and how they were treating players. You know, you'd be surprised at how many parents that I had calling me and they were apologetic because their kids, their student athletes were calling home saying, guess what? They went in tears. Mom, I want to quit. Mom, mm -hmm. I want to do this. And what do we do as parents? Guess what? Oh, push through. Don't worry about it. Be strong, be tough. And at the end of the day, so when it all came, you know, a tragedy came, the kids have been saying it all along. Yes. And as parents, we have to listen. Yes. We have to listen. We can't tell them push through every time because guess what? We teach boys that at an early age. Guess what? If you cry, you soft, 
this, that, and the third. So now what they do is they take that all the way through and we kind of, we create that, that false sense of reality or that false sense of rites of passage in a manhood. Boys don't cry. Boys don't do this. You know, now, you know, one of the things I always just tell Jordan, you can't quit. You can't quit on your team. And that's just one of my things. Like, I always feel like quitting is the, the easiest thing to do, but the hardest habit to break. So I didn't never, I never even realized until now, like I would always tell them, you can't never quit. You know, your last name, you, you carry our brand. So you can't quit, but you can't quit on your teammates. So even if kids don't feel as though, guess what? If they're not listening to their bodies, they're not going to quit because of their accountability to their teammates. And that's why we bring in Kobe and all programs like that, because we need young people to start really believing in themselves all the time. And you got to keep on believing in yourself. And that's really the main thing. Guess what? Listen to your body. If your body tells you to stop, stop. Now, Asa, let me ask you this. While you were running, right, while you all were running, did anything physically tell you, like, you know what, man, I, I'm, you know, I know, and, and this is in, in full transparency between us because, you know, we need you to tell other young people this, now, did you, and, and whether this happened or not, but did you physically feel a certain type of way before you went down? Um, I can't, I don't, I don't remember, because I don't even, I don't know when, but when I really, when I really, because uh, from what they're, what they said in like the ambulance reports and all that, I, I don't remember any of that, like the, the time leading up to when they called 911. Sure. The last thing I remember was like eight minutes before we were supposed to be done running and my legs, my legs were just burning, burning, burning. Like, cause, cause I did have, I had rhabdo. Uh, my legs were on fire. They were, they were hurting real bad. Like to the point where I, I would be running the lines and I, I would, I would just like I'd get to the last, like get to the baseline and I had to stop. Not cause I got to catch my breath. Not because anything except for my legs. My legs just were burning. It hurt so bad. And uh, I remember I told uh, one of my teammates, uh, the last thing I remember is uh, I told one of my teammates, I don't think I'm going anymore. And then I didn't tell the coach. I didn't want to, I didn't want to make it a thing. Like, I didn't want to be in front of like, the, whole, like, the whole team because – like you were saying about accountability and everything, I always wanted to be accountable. I always wanted to be because I, I never, I didn't miss a day of class, I didn't miss a workout, I didn't miss a practice. I was, I was trying to, I was, I wanted to be the best, and so I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna let being tired stop me from you know showing up. You know, I might, I might be running slower than you guys, but you know, I'm, I'm here. You know, like, let's do this. But uh, I told my teammate. I, I don't think I can go anymore. He's like, oh, you, no, you got this, you know? Like, look, look, just, like, and the clock is seven, eight minutes left. And I started running, and then it was black. And, you know, the interesting thing, while your legs were burning, you would have a heat stroke then. Those were the signs of a heat stroke. Those were the signs of heat exhaustion. But what we got to, and Asa, and again, we'd love to have you as an ambassador for, for TJMF, because guess what? A young person is going to listen to you tell that story as opposed to me. I can show signs. I can show graphs. I can show all of what to do. However, they're going to listen to you. They're going to listen to a Ryan Swoboda, you know, because again, you're the one that they can relate to. Yes. So we got some work for you to do. Take my word for it, for sure. But again, that's what young people need to hear. You have to listen to your body. Not when it's too late. You have to listen to it. Guess what? If it, it, And what we need to emphasize to our young people is you all, we have to know the signs and symptoms ourselves. And that's why we just really promote awareness, education, and prevention. Because if you have 20 coaches and you have 105 players on a basketball team or football team or whatever coaching them can't see everything and most importantly the more young people the more parents the more young people the more student athletes know guess what it may not have been hey we hate to run 
but I would feel a lot more comfortable if we out here running and we got a cold water tub in the event mm -hmm. of an emergency that's going to happen. Or at least some water to drink. Hey, I'm sorry, say that again, Julia. Or at least some water to drink. Exactly, correct. And, and again, I think that, you know, student athletes, once we finish with, once we get the Kobe word, the Kobe gospel spread, at least, you know, we can come as a team to say, guess what, coach? I mean, hey, where's the safety equipment? Where's this? It's a humid day. Guess what? We know statistics. These type of things happen on humid days. You know, it's the first day of practice. It's this. It's the third day of practice. You know, really, I'm. or most importantly, guess what? I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready, coach. Look, I'm going to give you 1,000%. But I'm just not ready. I don't feel good today or something. We have to speak up for ourselves. And as I told you, as a parent, as a, I, I thought I won father of the year for 19 years straight, but I just didn't teach Jordan. What I, and I don't, it's not what Tanya and I didn't teach. I felt as though I taught him everything that he needed to be successful at the next level, except for what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, and I take full responsibility for that. But one of the most important things I told Jordan to fight is, fight for himself, stand up for himself, never be a, a, a follow, always be a leader. Don't succumb to peer pressure. I told him all that. But one of the main things was, if you don't feel comfortable doing something, you do not have to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important thing that young people need to hear. And Asa, I think that you'd be the, I'd listen, if I was 19 to 20, you'd be the guy I'm going to listen to. Ryan Swoboda yes. is the guy that I'm going to listen to because guess what? Mr. Marty, he's a hundred years old to somebody like you. I don't know what I'm talking about, but you, you're relatable. You're the one that I, I, a young person or one of your peers is going to listen to from a perspective of I've been there, I've done that, this happened to me. So I know exactly what I'm talking about. So we, we, we definitely got some work for you to do. Um, hey, I'd like, to thank, I'd like to thank you guys for joining us. Um, Julia, thank you so much. Uh, Asa, thank you so much. Deb, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, in, in, in conclusion of this, because we really went on a lot longer than we usually go on, Asa, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. Talk to a, tell me, talk to a fellow student athlete. What piece of advice would you give them about self-awareness and listening to their bodies or player safety? Tell me. Like, I wish I, I wish, I wish I understood that uh, the team is, the team is important. The team is always important. And, and in most cases you should put the team before yourself. But when it gets to the point where you're putting the team before yourself is putting yourself in danger, then you got to think about yourself first. Because you know, if if I if if I didn't make it, if I if I if I didn't make it, they would still play. They would still have a season. They would still they would still go and try to get their D one scholarship. They would still do this. You know, whether or not whether or not I was on the team. They're still going to do their thing. Whether or not I'm still on the team, coach is still there. So, you know, be there for your teammates, but make sure make sure that you make sure that you stay healthy. You don't play through. I, I played. I I tried to go through injuries. I tried to you know don't play through injuries. Don't push, don't push yourself harder than you've ever been pushed before because. That's the thing. I pushed. I was pushing myself harder than I'd ever been pushed before, and I didn't know. I didn't know what could happen because I saw, like I saw, I saw Hank Gathers and like all those times people uh, people collapse. And I, I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's like that's crazy, but it's not gonna happen to me until it happens. So know that know that it's a real thing. Know that like. And if it if it does happen, I hope it doesn't to anybody. But if it does happen, just know it's, it's not your fault. It's it's never it's never your fault. So to to take away what you just said, don't put the team over yourself. Did I get some, that right? 
right? But yep. you know, in a in a sense, because you know, go to go to class, work hard, be the best, be the best teammate, be the best player you could be, but don't 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 do something that can end up harming you. If you feel like you've gone far enough, you know, tell the coach. The coach would rather you sit down. I know my coach. Like he would rather I just, you know, sat down. You know, it, it, like in the in the moment it doesn't seem like in the moment people the team's probably gonna be like, oh you quitting the coach is gonna be like, oh yeah you quitting go sit down. But you know in the long run I didn't if if I had said coach I, I, I can't go anymore, I could like you know, my life could be a lot different. But uh it's not and it's I could, at least I could say somebody else. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, Asa. That and that needed to be heard. Yes. Um, that needed to be heard. We we have to. Young people have to speak up for themselves, and speak up. We we can't wait till it becomes a tragedy or it becomes reactionary. We have to listen to our bodies. And guess what, Deb? You're a coach, a previous coach, three times. Um, and Deb, we've trained that th we've trained thousands of coaches, and er I haven't met a coach yet that their biggest fear hasn't been losing the child on their watch. Huge. Haven't met a coach that hasn't, that hasn't been their biggest fear. But again, we have to communicate as young people and we have to put ourselves always in a self-preservation model because at the end of the day, you know, you are the business. Guess what? Coach ain't going to the next level with you. You're going to the next level. If you make it, if you're blessed to make it to the next level. So again, every Asa, coach, thank you. Every coach here who knows Asa and knows his story has changed. Like I run in the last year since this has happened, I run into them all over the place and they tell me how they've changed how they're coaching just from the little bit they may know of Asa's story, yep. but can't have that many kids go through this so that we all change. We've got to all be getting the word out. Yep, you're absolutely right. So ladies, thank you. Julia, thank you. Deb, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, thank you. Your, your input has been very valuable. Asa, thank you. We'll definitely be in touch for sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you got any last words, Tanya, on our way out? Nice meeting everybody. Uh, Asa, <laughs> keep going with you, Jay. Yes, and sir. Julia, yes, um, that prayer, guard your will, that's, that's, that's an understanding that nobody will ever understand. That gives you a peace where it's just, I can't even explain it. So yeah. That passes understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's so good to see you. It's wonderful yeah. to see you. You too. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting, yeah. meeting you, Dad. Hey, yes. so, <laughs> you'll see my face more. You probably see yes, Marty and yes, see more Marty. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on behalf of the Jordan McNair Foundation, thanks so much for joining us and uh, please visit us. Don't forget to follow us on all our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you'd like to view any of our webinars in this series, please go to our website and click the Jordan McNair TV link. Thank you. Stay safe and have a good evening.